brought the women back to the fight and because of that because of their combined might that's how they overthrew the flame legion i'm not sure if the blog post will go into it if it does then i've just waited my breath but whatever okay so we go into a story here um and it opens you're a coward. You're a fool. Blades rang from their scabbards with the shrill sound of anger, and only the claws of the Iron Legion Centurion kept blood off the field. Stand down, both of you, the commander roared. His black eyes bored into the unruly troopers, and the two scrappers slowly put away their swords. I've got six warbands to organise, soldiers, and I can't waste time babysitting yours. Get your tails in gear. Five years you've been fighting like this. Kill each other already, or stop wasting my time. Legionnaire via split vein's fists clenched. She snarled in barely controlled obedience. Fine, but if this snivelling, white-jawed weakling tries to tell me what to do one more time, if I don't tell you and you blunder into an ambush, then it's on your head. The other char, a smaller male of the Ash Legion, rolled his claws over the hilts of his white-handled daggers. You and your Blood Legion warband will be turned into branded monsters, he sneered. Then again, being corrupted by a dragon might actually make you more pleasant, Veer. Via raged forward again, but the Centurion stood still in her way. Uncalled for, Ferus. The Centurion pushed them both back. Back off! Jabbing a thick finger into the black garb scout's chest, the Centurion said viciously, Your duty, Ash Trash, is to escort this warband through Foulbane Expanse to Keenar Fort. If you can't do that, then get me someone that can. Ferus benighted growled low in his throat and let go of his weapons. Fine. I promise I'll see them through the brand. Just keep that lunatic off my back. Fine, Via echoed. Show me the path and stay out of my way. Uh, I don't know, reading these stories, I feel like I should do more of a voice because if you can't actually see the text, like, I don't know, if I don't do voices, but I, I'm shit, I can't voice act or anything, so hopefully that's okay for you guys. Um, we continue on with a section called The Return of the Legions. So even after the Char recovered Ascalon, there were many challenges to overcome. The three legions of old, iron, ash and blood, struggled to establish their identities and hierarchies. Many leaders who continued to be faithful to the Flame Legion's regime were assassinated or overcome in combat. New voices rose in their place and the Char as a race fragmented. Only through the strength of the warbands, with their natural adherence to the chain of command, did the nation of Char survive this turbulent period. And, in an irony that was not lost on the Char, Edelburn's final curse became an integral part of that survival. Because there's something to unite and fight against, I guess. What's well, actually quite cool, I really like how they kind of emphasise this point here, because it was a well-known fact beforehand, from when we only had the ecology of the Char, that the only reason that Ascalonians got Ascalon in the first place, the humans got Ascalon, the only reason that happened was because the char got too big and started infighting they like started fighting amongst each other and sort of warring with themselves and the and the humans just took advantage of that time and they kind of pushed up you know there's all this stuff about how humans got magic from the gods and stuff like that as well which is why the char started looking from but the, one of the main reasons why humans got it was because of that because they're fighting each other and it goes back to this you know oh now now the humans are gone what do we do now and it's kind of very similar it's like oh shit now they're really really you know it's a turbulent period as it says they're really close to fighting one another again but it actually they still had something to fight against because of the faux fire if that wasn't there if they didn't have a united cause then who knows what would have happened you would have had all of them trying to compete and claiming that they had the can err and all this kind of shit going on and we could be in a very different not to say that the char are really well off this is something weird that arena net constantly have to do because they're like oh yeah the char have conquered they're doing amazing but they always have to hedge it constantly they have to go but but they've got these problems, and they're like, oh, but there are ogres around, oh, but there's this, oh, but there's this, oh, and don't forget the Elder Dragons. So they kind of have to make it seem like the Char have won a lot, but are also still on the back foot, which is why they need to, and they have to do that with all of the races, right? It's really easy with the Asura, because, you know, it was 250 years ago, sure, but where they evolved, where they grew up, where they lived underground, they've they've been taken out of there, you know, they, they've had to flee. It's the same with the humans, it's the same with the Norn in particular, having to flee from the far shiver peaks down south quite recently it wasn't only like 60 years ago or something i oh, know it wasn't 60 years ago it was quite a long time ago because the norn that were there at the time have probably died by now but anyway so they, they've all had they're all supposed to be on the back step but then they've got the char that have won something so so yeah uh, there, there is quite a lot of lore to do with what's been going on with them i just had the longest i think i literally just drank a pint of water in an instant flat i had no idea i was that thirsty okay um, we get some cool concept, oh yeah, what other concept art from this? Uh, there was some concept art at the start, I'll be sure to edit that in somewhere. We get some more here, with a uh, sort of, uh, a small warband of Char, I suppose, um, standing in formation. Uh, kind of similar to, I guess, what they're talking about there in the story up above. Um, 
And the article goes on to say, uh, Once the Flame Legion's hold was broken, the shamans and their followers fled into the Blaze Ridge Mountains to lick their wounds. Escape was possible, primarily because the other three legions were so focused on rebuilding their internal hierarchies after generations of Flame Legion control. But after the structures of iron, ash and blood were rebuilt, it seemed almost impossible that the three legions wouldn't immediately fall upon one another and take advantage of any weaknesses, potentially eradicating themselves. That's exactly what might have happened, had it not been for the Ghost of Ascalon. Edelburn's curse upon... I, I love this idea of the char, actually, just up there for a sec before we go on. I love that idea that they as a race only grow stronger by tearing each other's throats out and just exploiting every weakness in themselves until only the strongest remain. That's so cool. Um, and it's just so vicious and it fits them so perfectly. Edelburn's curse upon the lands of Ascalon swept through the humans. In a white hot moment, it destroyed their physical forms and cursed their spirits to wander the land, forever fighting against the Char. Because the ghostly enemy was unrelenting and never completely defeated, the High Legions of the Char were forced to work together from the outset if they wished to survive. Although they detested the forced unity, they needed to defend themselves and Ascalon taught the three legions how to work together without sacrificing their individuality. This is something I've just thought of actually with the whole faux fire thing and the ghosts. What always depresses me when I'm reading this it's, it's always kind of there at the back of my head always 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 it's like they set up all this storyline and how the ghosts are there now and Guild Wars 2 is you know it's obviously making pushes to try and make the world a bit more dynamic and have actual changes happen but this is the kind of thing where if this was a single player game you could pretty much point at that and say ah oh, in you know, a part of the story we're obviously going to lift this curse and the faux fire will be over and char can truly have ascalon again and it's like well i don't know because that can't happen in an mmo so it's a bit weird it kind of reduces this whole story a, a, a little bit i guess it feels like it just sort of reduces it into oh look this is an excuse for something for the char to do and we'll never really fix it I suppose dynamic events can allow us to push Char out of certain sections of Ascalon, but you know, like Ascalon City itself, that's still a hotbed of ghost activity. And you know, I, I have to wonder whether we'll ever really see Ascalon become clean again. They do write some law, I think it's in the movement of the world, I don't think we really hear very much about it afterwards. In the movement of the world, some of the first law they wrote about it was this idea that the two swords of sort of the, the two Ascalonian royal swords, these ancient relics, uh, Edelburn had one and Rurik had one, um, Soathin and Madgea, I think is how you say the other one. These two swords, they, they wrote this law that if the swords were brought back together, it could end the faux fire and the curse would be lifted. But then come Edge of Death, and, and they, they obviously established by saying Rurik had one, they established that one was on the Fire Island chain and this was the idea, oh this is why the players have to go to the Fire Island chain in Guild Wars 2. Um, sort of to go back to his body and pick the sword back up. But then in Ghosts of Ascalon, sorry, in, in Edge of Destiny, they kind of established that Ritlock randomly has the sword. And that's a little bit weird. I do, see, they've written lore about it. They're like dangling it there. It's like, how are they, what are they, they going to do? What are they going to do? Like what World of Warcraft did with Cataclysm, where they release an expansion and just drastically change the face of areas. Uh, is that what they're going to do? And sort of. One of the Guild Wars 2 Ascalon, one of the Guild Wars 2 expansions is going to be like Ascalon Reborn or something. I don't know, it's, it's weird because it, like, Ascalon's a starter area as well, right? At least partially it's, it's, a, it's a starter area. So, I well, know that, that probably doesn't really mean anything, I suppose, because if you think of the brand, that's really high level. But in any case, it's weird. I don't know what they're going to do there. It's certainly interesting to think about. I don't know, have you, got, have you guys got any thoughts on that? Would you even like to see the ghost be driven back out? I don't know, see? But anyway, we move on. Um, currently, the Iron, Ash and Blood Legions operate under a shaky alliance. So even after all these years, it's still shaky. Smodor the Unflinching commands the Iron Legion from his stronghold in the Black Citadel. So uh, don't forget, this is all Iron Legion territory, really. East, across the Blaze Ridge Mountains, Imperator Bangar Ruinbringer controls the lands of the Blood Legion. So you, so this is this is the, this one line. This is all we get. I've talked about this quite a lot as, as we've been talking about the Char recently. But this is the only line you get that talks about what is east of those mountains. That's how we know that that's char controlled territory right there um, and that is uh, the Blood Legion over there. So don't forget they did just say that the Flame Legion, the remnants of the Flame Legion anyway, fled into the Blaze Ridge Mountains as well so they could be like stuck in the middle. I don't know, it's been a lot of years since then they might have moved somewhere else. There is a map 
out there. I'm ca I can't remember if it's if it's a demo map or if it was um, like a long time ago before a lot of the demos were out or just after some of the demos had come out. We had maps of areas that weren't actually playable in the demo, um, and that, to this day they're still the only maps we've got of certain areas. So, for instance, around Drocknas Forge. Oh yeah, I wanted to talk about that as well. Anyway, uh, d d these maps though. One of the maps talks about where some of the Flame Legion people um, are in one of the areas. It's like Flame Legion Citadel marked on the map or something. It's really cool looking at the maps. But yeah, about Drocknas Forge actually. A bit of a tangent here. There was an interview um, with Reese Sosby, Sosby, like a, an audio interview that I listened to. I haven't mentioned this at all in any of my videos. I might mention it again in the uh, the Let's Play in a bit. But um, there was an interview that went out, and she talked about uh, Drocknars Forge. We know about the Steam Spur Mountains for a long time. We've known that sort of the way that all that area of the Southern Shiver Peaks looks very different now, and we knew that there was Hylek territory around there, and it was all a little bit weird, and that it had a different name. But we didn't know why, right? Well, she said in the interview, she basically answered it as, as far as I could see. Anyway, it's answer enough for me. She said, uh, the Crucible of Eternity. Okay, that's what Drop Class Forge is called now. Um, and she said that it's a really good example of a place that looks in extremely different come Guild Wars 2. That whole area is really tropical now. And she said it's because a volcano erupted. And it's a bit out there, but all right, it's a fantasy world. <laughs> a volcano erupted and completely changed the geography of the area and just changed it all. Which is really cool. I love that idea. It's so awesome. So uh, that's why that place is all tropical now. But yeah, we've got a map of there as well. And you can actually see um, really interestingly there's a dynamic event chain or at one point in the game's development anyway there was a dynamic event chain to do with the uh, stone summit there which is really cool considering what's going on with the dwarves and how few dwarves there are and yet there's a stone summit thing and they've got this big machine or something called a ruinator or something it's really quite cool anyway back to the chart um where where do we get to so yeah imperator bang our ruin bringer controls the bands of the blood legion over there uh, malice sword shadow i mean we can tell this is ash legion straight away which <laughs> that is so clearly an ash legion name sword shadow a young female char rules as an imperator of the Ash Legion. So this is quite cool. So I wonder if we'll meet Malice Sword Shadow or if we'll meet Bangar Ruinbringer. I, I suppose we probably will in the personal story. But we're, we're definitely not going to their land at, at launch. And I think it's quite cool that they already know that the Ash Imperator is a young female char. It's like they've got... So they talk about this internal wiki they've got as well with like all the answers to all the lore and stuff that they use all the time and I feel like they must just have like these huge like personality profiles of these characters that are obviously going to be really minor characters at launch you know they're, they're really important characters to the char don't get me wrong but it's mostly about the Iron Legion here in Guild Wars 2 at launch so I mean I don't know unless the other legions kind of say oh no we're not going to help you Iron Legion but then no, no that doesn't make any sense because you can pick what legion you're with anyway so th that's her she's an Imperator of the Ash Legion and she's back up at the uh, what we knew as the char homelands come Guild Wars 1 uh, although the three legions bicker and occasionally squabble, they have managed to maintain the general state of accord. Each legion is independent, but all three send troops and support to Ascalon to eradicate the human threat. Smodor knows full well that Malice's troops are there not only to aid, but also to spy for their Imperator. However, the two leaders respect one another. Bangar is the true wild card, distrustful and prone to rage. Still, here's... <laughs> and that so typical of a blood legion imperator i mean come on it's just so perfect uh, still his hatred for humans overcomes his suspicions about the other imperators and he has committed a great number of troops to the black citadel's command so this is kind of the reason why hey you can pick what legion you want and you'll be at the black citadel but look it doesn't really matter all the legions are around there anyway um we get back to the story here so uh a storm raged in the brand. Lightning flashed here and there, illuminating slithering, crystalline things roaming the corrupted plains. A lone char warband marched across the shifting sand, boots treading over ground too treacherous and constantly changing to map. Ferris paused, holding up one fist to signal a silent halt. The Blood Legion warband instantly froze in place. Via smelled the air, catching no more than a faint hint of danger. After a moment, the scout slunk back to them, crawling over the broken roots to whisper, Hostiles up ahead. Looks like trouble. He sketched a quick map in the sand, indicating their location, distance, and number. They've already got our scent. Then it's killing time. Via's eyes narrowed. She glanced back at her warband, friends since childhood. Their faces were drawn and stiff. They knew the danger. The flat land ahead was solid. Even. It would make an excellent place to fight. Prepare assault. Two on the rear, the rest with me. At my signal, 
Four massive creatures crested the hill. They were hideous, twisted by the energies of the brand. Judging by their malformed skulls and huge clawed paws, the monstrosities might once have been bears or mountain cats. Now they were nothing but twisted shells filled with the dragon's murderous hatred. Four. Far more than they could handle. She wasn't even sure the warband could defeat one. Via didn't realise she'd taken a step back until she felt Ferris's hand on her forearm, quietly steadying her balance. Are you alright? he asked. His voice was low, and her quick ears barely caught his meaning. They're big. She whispered the trembling words before she realised she'd spoken. Stiffening, Via pulled her arm away as if his hand was a hot coal pressed against her skin. She reached for her sword. Don't be such a coward, Ferris. We can take them. Ferris smiled, an expression not particularly different from his snarl. We can sure as hell try. So this is quite cool. Uh, one thing about that story, I, I don't know how much commentary I should sort of go back on the story. I, I wonder if I should just let you guys enjoy it. But one thing to bear in mind so far with the story is obviously Warbands, these are, they're, they're basically the family to the char. They grew up together, they spent all their time together, and they genuinely care a lot about each other. So when a Warband's fighting together, you're fighting for the lives of your own family, you know, which is a really cool idea because that makes people fight so much harder. So the next section is the Citadel's Master. The Imperator of the Iron Legion is a stern old soldier, a veteran of countless battles, known as Smodor the Unflinching. Smodor is burly, exceptionally- see, and he's an old soldier, I, I don't know, it, they might be setting up com- well, no, I, I guess the whole point is they just want to point out that these Imperators, these Legions, it is a shaky alliance and all the Imperators are very different from one another, you can definitely see it. Even just looking at the age of the of the Iron Legion Imperator and the Ash Legion, it's just, you, you, can, you can just imagine that there'll be conflicts there, it's just, it's just crazy. But, that, but they, they did say that they respect each other, so okay. Uh, Smodor is burly, exceptionally muscular for his age and carries the scars of a soldier's life. He has only one eye left, which he uses to peer glaringly at his subordinates, and his blue-tinged plate mail has been repaired far too many times to count. Smodor is a consummate engineer and a brilliant architect and designer. Over the years, he's been responsible for many advancements that have increased the Iron Legion's strength. The Imperator considers his Legion to be the most forward-thinking of all charts. So don't forget this, this is what Iron Legion are about, they're, they're as far as you can call them that, they're the inventors of the char, they're the ones that do the tinkering, they're the ones that brought around guns and flamethrowers and all these tanks and shit, you don't, oh yeah, actually, okay, so when char week came out, um, when each of these race weeks come out, as you know, they do a video, which I've not been showing you on the channel, but if you go to guildwars2.com, uh, you'll see them there if you click races and you'll see it. If you watch the char one, um, they, they release new footage when they did it, some of it's reused footage from the trailers that we'd seen before that always used to get people's back up when the weeks were coming out on the forums, they'd be like, oh, this is, there's not enough new stuff. But they'd also show some new stuff in there as well. They'd splice in new stuff. And on the Char Week, they uh, the new stuff that they spliced in that caused a bit of a, uh, a minor bit of controversy, I, I suppose, um, they were like Char tanks, like literal tank vehicle things with spikes on the wheels and it's just ridiculous and you can see them there. Uh, they did in an interview later, you know, mounts in Guild Wars 2 was a big thing, they, they they were constantly saying we don't know if we're doing them and we want to do them right if we do, we know that it changes the face of the game quite a lot, blah 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 um, but uh, eventually they did say that there will not be mounts at launch and uh, everyone was like well what the hell's going on with these vehicles but apparently the NPCs can and do drive these things, it's ridiculous, it looks amazing but anyway that's what the iron league they're the forgers they're the ones that make this crap right they're the forward thinking of all the char due to smodor's unusually progressive nature other races are allowed in the black citadel as long as they prove their worth to the char yeah i mean progressive nature as well i mean think about it he he's the one that did all this with the treaty with the humans and stuff like this um and i wouldn't be surprised to hear that he was the one that was that's been encouraging the char to invent this kind of stuff and all this kind of thing he seems like he's a really out of all the imperators i reckon he's probably gonna die in the storyline because he seems like a genuine decent imperator and he's a he's a good guy for the char i can just it would be so perfect for him to die um, and then see what I think would be cool if they did with Guild Wars 2 right is if they had it so that 
you did the the first part of the game is going to be devoted to your your personal racist storyline right so what i think would be cool is if you kind of did some stuff and your your personal storyline escalates and then something big happens in your personal storyline but then it's like oh shit no we've got to band together and deal with the dragons anyway uh, like zaitan and then maybe in an expansion they'll go back to what's going on with each individual racist storyline but it would be really interesting because what i think would be quite cool here a big thing to happen would be if if he died i could just imagine him dying in your your per like the races bit of the storyline and another one of these uh imperators coming into it but he's not forward thinking he's totally bad for the iron legion he screws up the treaty with the humans he screws up the the unsteady alliance with the other legions he just messes everything up i could just imagine that so perfectly it's a tried and true storyline it's been done many times and many different things but i could just th th that would just work i i would i can totally see them setting that up Smodot, Smodot, as it says here, is even working on a treaty with the humans, defending the stronghold of Ebonhawk, a place that has long been a thorn in the Iron Legion's side. As a condition for considering the treaty, the Char require the humans to return an ancient weapon lost during the foe fire, the claw of the Can Ur. So this is what the Can Ur, of course, needs. Um, and this is quite a cool storyline here. I suppose the idea is the Char originally owned Ascalon, okay? Then they lost the claw of the Can Ur. There was no way to prove who was the rightful new Can Ur, and the Can Ur, of course, is the leader that owns all of the the legions and unites the entire Char race, right? They lost that. All the infighting happened. The humans pushed the Char out of Ascalon, and I suppose the story here is, ooh, and the claw was still in Ascalon, and the, the humans found it and hid it away and squirreled it away and made sure the Char could never get it again because they knew that if the Char couldn't get it, they'd never have the, the, the strength of unity to come back at them. So now, all this time later, um, the, the Kanur is, is brought back into the story and the Char want it back, which is really quite cool. That's another thing that could massively shake up what's going on with the Char and their society and how everything works. And of course, that's what uh, Ghost of Ascalon is about. That book is about the this part of, of people that are going to get the claw of the can air. Um, some say that Smodor demands the return of the legendary weapon so that he can use it to bolster his authority and claim rulership of the char. Other rumours imply that the unconventional Imperator wishes to melt down the claw and destroy the legacy of the Kanur, in the hopes that his people will continue moving forward and never look back. I reckon that's a really cool idea as well, you know, he's forward thinking, he's, he's different, I can imagine him doing that, that'd be a super cool plot if he, if he just turned around. People would hate him for it, a lot of Char would hate him for it, but it is probably better for them I'd say, I don't think that they could, well I don't know. If the legions were got rid of completely, I mean, let's face it, they are on a shaky alliance at best right now. If the the uh, the legions just ceased to exist and the char were just the char with their own nation and their own military, and you know that might be better. But I don't know. Thing is, it, it just this crap screwed the char over once before. So if the the canner sort of came back into the picture, would it not just screw them over again? Um, we're back into the story here. 